continue our conversation on the five P's. We are so excited that you're joining us. If you're a part of our online community and uh, that online campus, thanks for being a part of today's conversation where we're going to talk about your personal ministry. Uh, so here's the first question I have. If you have your phone and you're used to like checking in when you get here, those on Facebook, I honestly, I don't know if Instagram has a check-in mode, but if it does do that, but if you want to check in today, here's the question I have. And this is specifically for the women who are married. Are you married to Bob the Builder, Bob Vila, or gosh, who was the other Bob? I forgot it now. Uh, the... Um, no, no, Tim Taylor, that's who it is. Tim, Tim's not a Bob, that's right. So Tim the Bob Man Taylor. So are you married to Tim the T Tool Man Taylor, Bob the Builder, the wannabe, but you know it's probably just going to be like really made up, or Bob Vila, someone who actually knows what he's doing. So I, it's just a question I love. Last week I had some fun interaction of who do you call, and so when it comes to this week, I am just want to know the skill level of the person in the house next to you. Now, I will say this. Husbands, if she's the fixer and you want to go ahead and post, I'd love to know what it is, but just be aware at some point you're calling your spouse Bob or Tim, so it, it's what you're dealing with. Uh, here's where we are. We're in the middle of a conversation where we're going to talk about the tools that God uses on a regular basis to help us take our next step in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And three of these tools you can do on purpose for yourself to grow. Like the first one we talked about was practical application or practical teachings. How do we take the word of God, like a can of paint, rather than viewing it in this like substance, viewing it in this paper form, how do we take this paper form of the word of God, dip into it and apply it with practical teachings to our life? Because to say we know what it says versus living the way it says, it's two different things. So you don't have to be inspired by God. You don't have to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. You can just choose to get into the word of God and practically apply it to your life. Uh, last week, we talked about our personal, uh, uh, our private devotions, private disciplines. And uh, the one that we talked about was fasting. And this is the time in our life where we have limited amount of resources when it comes to food, when it comes to time, and when it comes to money. And so we're going to give our limited resources to God. And when it comes to fasting, like a chalk line, you have a starting point, you have an ending point, but until you fast or pop that chalk line, you won't see what the two connecting points are. And so that we also talked about when it comes to your, your private disciplines, we talked about your prayer life. Your prayer life is like a toolbox of all the little knick-knack gadgets. And what we want is when we pray to go to a hardware store and buy exactly what we need and have God fulfill it right there at the moment. But here's what prayer is really like. Prayer is storing away the little things. Storing away the promises, storing away the power, storing away what you need. And then another one that we talked about was when it comes to our tithing, this private discipline. And we use the example of a nail of how our lives, those of us that live generous lifestyles, a giving lifestyle, our lives are actually held together by the things that no one sees. And it's tithing. By the way, I have an incredible testimony. This is one of those things that after I read it, you're going to want to clap and shout and say, why didn't I get in on this? This past week, I got a message from someone. Uh, decided after the tithing conversation, here's exactly what they said. After Sunday service, I decided to bump up my tithe. And by the way, there's a part of the story that he shared with me out of Numbers 17. And in this number 17 is a promise from God that will increase you a hundredfold. And so ready for this? He said, after Sunday service, I decided to bump up my tithe. Well, yesterday I finished a side job and decided to make an offer to pay off my bond deed, uh, the, the bond for deal I had on my house, and this individual accepted. As I started processing, I realized that I'm paying it off 17 months early. Remember number 17 that he's inspired out of. Paying it off 17 months early on the 17 month, 17th day of the month, and then I'm going to save $7,000, which is a hundred times what my weekly tithe is. Mind blown. So out of this inspired passage of number 17, promising a hundredfold on your giving on the 17th day, 17 months early, receiving a hundred times back uh, what his weekly tithe is. Mind blown. This is awesome. This ministry has done more than I can possibly imagine. 
And so this is, this is one of two messages I just received last week about people who heard about tithing and is stepping into a growing aspect of what that is in their life. And so this week, the, the first two disciplines we talked about are disciplines that you can choose to apply to your life at any time. You don't need Holy Ghost inspiration. God's not going to come down and tap you on the sh your shoulder and say you should pray more. God's not going to come tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you should practically apply my word. These are things that we can do. And even today, today's spiritual discipline is going to be this. It's your personal ministry. And so these are things that we can intentionally do. Now, next week, we're going to cover the two that not so often comes up. And, and by the way, if, if these five Ps, I want to make sure to give credit to Andy Stanley. These came from his book called Deep and Wide. So next week, we're going to talk about these pivotal moments that occur in our life. But usually, God sends a providential relationship. So of the five disciplines, three of them you can do on your own. But usually, the other two come up without you ever seeing. And that's just God's gift to our life. And so in talking about personal ministry, here's what it's going to be. Today's handy dandy fifth grade level teaching that I've decided to do during this whole series, it's going to be a tool belt. And here's why. Have you ever had events happen in your life that you don't know why they happen? You don't know why you experienced them. You don't know why you felt that way. You don't know why you learned the lesson that you learned. I believe it's because it's something that God wants to put in your tool belt of life. And if you've ever done a job before, recently my wife, she does some interior design work and she has an individual that always goes and helps her. And this individual couldn't do help on this install day. So she had me go help. And which, by the way, I've already told you that Jesus was a carpenter. I am not. But don't worry. This is like hanging photos. I, you know, Bobo knows how to do that. So, so. But here's what I did. I went and I took my tools and I took my level and I took my hammer and I took my nails and stuff like that. And every time I had to hang something, I'm running all around the house because I never had everything with me at once. I didn't think about bringing a tool belt. And here's why I didn't think about bringing a tool belt. I don't own a tool belt. This tool belt I had to borrow just for today because I was well too cheap to go buy one for the service. So like... <laughs> But the whole time I'm running around and then I forgot this hammer and then I run back over here and there's pictures that need staples taken out. So I had to go back here and get these needle nose things and I had to pull all the staples out. And I found myself running all around and I was like, man, at wish I wouldn't just have a tool belt with me so I could put everything I need with me at any time and so that any time I could pull it out and use it. And here's what I believe. I believe God gives us a tool belt in life and it's called life experiences. There are life experiences we have, life lessons that we learn, school of hard knocks that we covered earlier in this year, that what do you do with these life experience? And I guess you could experience them just for you to be better. But what if, what if something that you've gone through, what if something that's been hammered in you, nailed in you, kind of, uh, boy, I can't use that phrase. It involved a screw, and I figured that that would be really appropriate if I said it, but I think you just figured out what ran through my brain. But kind of screwed. Okay, so there it is. I, I can't come up with another one. So what if all these things, no one, everyone knows that I shouldn't have used it. So, but what if all those things could be used for the benefit of someone else? And so this is when it's going to come in line of what personal ministry is. And by the way, personal ministry can look completely different. I want to tell you where I know this revelation firsthand. Years ago as a church, we realized that we were having zero impact in our community. We, and the reason why we, I'm comfortable saying that, there was an ice storm that came, hit this area, and shut down this entire block that our church sits on. We were without power for two weeks. And no one in the community seemed to know or care. And I was sitting there going, if Walmart was out of power for two weeks, don't you think like the community would be calling Amron going, hey, by, by the way, those watching online, Amron's our local power for you to know that. Like, don't you think the community would be calling going, we need our Walmart because we need our milk, we need our toilet paper, and we need our hammers and screws. And so like, like at some point, everyone else would be clamoring for Walmart to be open, but no one was clamoring for our church to be open. And I'm sitting there going, why is it that the community doesn't care about us? We need something to happen to where the community knows we're here. We need to do something outrageous. Like, like if a tornado came ripping through, the community rallies around because it's a big cause. We need to be a tornado. How do we become a tornado? You know what we need to do? We need to build the world's largest cookie. 
And it's like, no, we can't build the world's largest cookie. That's stupid. But you know what we do have? We have a big ketchup bottle that isn't the world's largest ketchup bottle because it's a water tower. What if we built the world's largest ketchup packet? And I still remember being in the office. I can tell you who, who was with me, where I was. And we were like, we need to build the world's largest ketchup packet. Well, how are you going to build it? I don't know. When are you going to build it? I don't know. How are you going to pay for it? I don't know. But here's what I know. I know that at that moment, I had a God-given idea that I was going to have to do something with. And so we're going to fast forward in time. Because in time, we come to find out that, by the way, here in Collinsville, those watching online, you're just not going to get this, I promise you. So we have something yearly known as the Ketchup Bottle Festival. And, and it's a big deal around here. It's only second to our Horseradish Festival. And again, unless you're in the area, you're just not going to get it. So, But this Ketchup Bottle and this car show was having an argument of who gets to throw the yearly festival. And all of a sudden, they decide they're not going to have a ketchup bottle festival. And I was at that meeting. And the person running the meeting, which, by the way, an atheist, looks at me and says, you should tell them your idea. And I was like, no, I'm not going to tell you my idea because they're in the middle of a fight. And if I jump in, they're going to punch me. Not interested. And then this, again, atheist, non-believing God prophesies to me and says, you should share your idea. And Bobo finally figured out, oh, God, you may be wanting me to share this idea. And I go, hey, we're thinking about building the world's largest ketchup packet. And they said, okay, fine. If you build it, we'll bring our party to your property. So now a citywide party that normally happens on Main Street is now going to happen on our facility, and we're trying to figure out how to pay for it. So we call Heinz Ketchup Bottle, or Ketchup Bottle Packet, whoever they are. They write us a $10,000 check and provides all the ketchup that we need to be able to dump into a ketchup packet. So now we have money, now we have people coming, and a week and a half before the party's supposed to set off, a 10,000 square foot part of our building burns down. So now we have a massive fire. We're on the news nonstop for an entire week. That news is advertising one big event that happens to be coming up, which now is a fundraiser. Because we lost it. Too. I didn't make it a fundraiser. The news people did because they report accurately. <laughs> that was a jab. Okay, so... So now we come here this day, we throw a massive party, we build the world's largest ketchup packet, and we had friends from, Calif or from Hawaii call us and say, why are you on our local news station? Remember that? Local news station. Heinz did market research to found out, find out we got millions of dollars worth of free advertisement because there was no other news on that Saturday. Everybody picked it up. And here's what I can tell you. I did none of it. I had an idea to build a ketchup packet, and I did everything I could. And when my limitations ended, God did everything he was going to do. When it comes to personal ministry, that's how it works. And if you don't believe that, I'm, I'm, I, how about this? Everyone, there's my parable. How about we go to the scriptures? And I'm going to show you in the scripture out of Matthew 14. This is exactly how God does it. So if you, if you have your Bibles, open it up. If, you're, if you want to download our app, we have all the scriptures there for you. You can make additional notes on it. Download the, uh, the, the notes at the end to your device so you have it. Matthew 14 says this, When Jesus heard what, it, what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place, Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. Pause real quick. When Jesus heard what had happened, this is kind of big news. So when it comes to personal ministry, this is a life lesson I think all of us need to hear. Jesus just heard that his, I would say, best friend, the scriptures doesn't say it, but his cousin, John the Baptist, just was beheaded. John the Baptist, who is this guy? John the Baptist was the last Old Testament prophet that we see in, the, in this time. John the Baptist was out in the desert saying, prepare ye away. There's a man, I'm baptizing with water. He's coming to baptize with fire. And all these religious people in the temple that had all the money, had all the lights, had all the stages, had all the robes, they weren't drawing a dime. They weren't drawing a people. John the Baptist, dressed in camel hair, eating locusts and honey in the wilderness, starts making this call out, and he draws hundreds of th or thousands of people towards him. And may I just say this, this is the first mega church in the New Testament. 
John the Baptist is out there. All of a sudden, Jesus comes along, and John says this to his mega church: I know that you guys love me. I know that I'm a big deal. I know that you've been following me. It's time for my mega church to leave me and go with him. The understanding, the power, the revelation this guy had. And so now, Jesus' ministry gets kicked off by church transfer, boop, straight to Jesus. Crowds are now following Jesus, and who's also John the Baptist's cousin. And Jesus finds out that his cousin has just been killed, been murdered. Why? Because he spoke truth. But then he, he withdrew privately to a solitary place. Every commentary says this, that he enacted his private discipline of prayer. So anytime we go through a pivotal moment in our life, I know there's a lot of things we want to do to numb. There's a lot of things that we want to have outbursts. There's a lot of things that we want to get angry about. Maybe we should take a hint from Jesus that when you have a pivotal moment in your life, you need to go to your toolbox that you've been investing in, which is a private devotion, and you pull out prayer and you find your time with God. And so now Jesus, all these people start following him. And when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and began healing their sick. I also find something very interesting. Jesus does something I think is opposite of what we traditionally do. When Jesus was hurting, when Jesus was disappointed, when Jesus was probably frustrated, rather than isolating himself and licking wounds, Jesus chose to pour out to less fortunate than him. I, I, I probably have seen this before. Maybe I've even said it before. But today I've seen it before in a way that I've never had. Is there a chance in order for us to truly overcome the disappointments in life, one way to possibly do it is to actually engage your personal ministry and start loving on the world around you versus abandoning the world around you? So Jesus starts ministering to those people. And in the evening approach, the disciples came to him and said, hey, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. And Jesus replied, no need for them to go away. You feed them. With what? Like, what do you mean? Jesus, by the way, you're going to find out there's 5,000 men, not counting women and children. So can we just say there's 15,000 people there? Nice round. Everyone was married. Everyone had one kid. And you're like, well, maybe not everyone's married. But then you run into families like me. We're married with four kids. Like, we throw off the numbers. So, like, right? so, so at this point, let's just go with like 15,000 people. And they go, hey, what are we supposed to feed them? Verse 17, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. And so here's what happens with our personal ministry. We know our own limitations. Uh, by the way, this is a pop quiz. You ready for this? I know you guys. When it comes to disciples, what did most of them used to do for a living? They fished. Okay. So these fishermen, they know their, they know their market and they're looking at 15,000 people with two pieces of fish. And here's what all their years of experience tells them. This ain't enough. Right? And now, I have a question. Does any of you need to be fishermen and worked on deadliest catch up in Alaska to know the fact that if I wanted to feed just who's here today and 18 of you watching us on our online campus and I only had two pieces of fish, all of us are thinking slim sushi. Like, not, not much here. So you don't even need to be a rock star, but here's what happens. Whenever you know yourself enough you actually know the limitations that you face. And there's times in our life where I believe that God wants to go against our own belief systems in order to show who he is compared to what we are. So it could have been anything. It could have been lamb. It could have been flatbread. It could have been, it could have been anything. But it happens to be the one thing that these men knew really well. And here's what they know. No matter what we do with this type of fish, you can boil this in as much water that you want. But eventually this amount of water is not even going to taste like fish water. Like there's nothing we can do here. right? Fish water. I'm glad that one person like understood. And by the way, the one person was my brother. So I, like, th that's why we're kind of on a similar wavelength on that one. And so here's what Jesus said. Well, bring them here to me. Because guys, I'm going to have you do what you do. 
But then why don't you stand back and see what I'm going to do? And so here's what they could have said. Jesus, I'm not interested in bringing these fish to you. You need to send them away so they can go get food. Maybe Chick-fil-A is still open because they're a Christian company. And we'll just send everyone. Oh, it's Sunday. Uh, they don't love you that much. Like, Okay, so like, what are we going to do? We need to send them away. And they could have actually said no to Jesus at this point. But are they willing to take the limitations of who they are and bring it to Jesus? And so they brought it to Jesus, and he directed all the people to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves, the two fish. He looked up to heaven, gave thanks, and broke them. And so it was like, oh, great, now we have ten and four. This is going to do a lot more. And then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. And all ate, and all were satisfied, and the disciples ended up picking up 12 baskets, a full of broken pieces that were left over. I think this is the worst sentence in the Bible that we could find. Jesus prayed, broke it, looked up to heaven, gave it to the disciples, and then it just says, the disciples gave it away. No, the disciples freaked out when they reached into a basket and handed someone a fish, freaked out when they reached into a basket, gave someone a fish, then they came to the third guy, reached their hand into the basket, it was a fish. Handed it away. Reached their hand into the basket to the fourth guy. So even if he broke the fish in half, which now you have the guts coming out and there's all the entrails and all that. Okay, so you got a tail, you got a head, you got a tail. Let's say the fish are whole. Now they're on guy 42. They're reaching in the basket and there's still fish coming out. I don't know about you, but I'd be looking over going, Peter, is your <laughs> And then there's people like four rows back that are like, well, they're going to run out of food. And then the disciples come along and like, we're not running out of food. Like, here it is. Check it out. It keeps coming. At some point, this sentence needs to be a whole lot longer because 15,000 people just kept getting fed and kept getting fed and kept getting fed and kept getting fed because when you tap into what Jesus has for us and we partner with him, there is no limitation to the impact that we can have. But are we willing to bring who we are and all the limitations that it has and say to God, I will bring you all of who I am, all of my life experiences, all of my disappointments, all of my hurts, all of my pains, all of my stories, and I'll bring this limited person to who you are. And then next thing you know, someone comes inside of you, it comes up to you and you find out, oh, I just lost a baby at 12 weeks. And years ago, you lost a baby and you went processing through it and you were mad at God when it happened. You were disappointed that this occurred because this was the child. This was gonna be the first baby girl that the family had. This was the first baby boy that the family had. And everyone was excited and you felt like your life was ripped away from you. And you, God, why did this happen? And you've just been storing this anger. You've been storing this bitterness. You've been storing this frustration. You never turn from God. But then all of a sudden you're standing in church and I know that you met a miscarriage years ago and someone else comes walking in and they're weeping and they say, last night we found out we lost our baby. And all of a sudden I bring someone next to you and I say, listen, here's someone who may know what you're feeling like. Do you leave your tool belt patched away or do you think this? And by the way, if you've ever thought this before, you're right on. Who am I to have this conversation with this? person. We're nobody. We're broken down fishermen with only two fish and five loaves. But guess what? There's a chance if you're willing to reach into your tool belt of life experience, there's a chance you can pull something out and go, I didn't even know that was in there. I didn't know I had that to give. I didn't know that I could feed you. I didn't know I could bless you. And then afterwards, you will realize you have an abundance left over. Why? Because when God pulls from you, he doesn't leave you depleted. He leaves you filled. So now the disciples, they're picking up all the food afterwards. All right, sweet, sweet Jesus. I can't believe this just occurred. And all the people were satisfied. In number, they were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And then immediately Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go ahead of them to the other side. Well, I get on the other side as Jesus dismissed the crowd. I, I, I love this sentence because anyone who's done personal ministry before, as far as a church service, there's no such thing as just dismissing the crowd. 
But here's, here's how this works, by the way. Not, not in pandemic time, because this is real easy. It's like, put on your mask and walk out the door. We're not talking to you. But like, that's how we do it now. But here's what normally happens, right? Like, you say, hey, we're going to pray for people. And somehow Christians all know to come get in a straight line. Boop, they go shoulder to shoulder. And, you know, make it easy for the person to pray for you. And then other people get behind them in case you fall down. And then other people with cloths, if they fall down, we're going to have modesty and we're going to put it on top of you. And you go through and you pray. And the next thing you know, you get done praying, you're tired, your voice, man, whoo, not only is your voice shot, your mouth is dry, and you got sick halitosis going on. Like there's bad breath that happens. That's why there's a whole ministry team just for men's. I really have to get the sermon moving on. But for some reason, I'm enjoying painting this picture for you. So I don't know if people are getting slain in the spirit or if you just go, dear Jesus. And they go, dear Jesus. Like, like they just, they just want to get away from you, you know? So I have a question. Is there anybody out there who knows exactly what I'm talking about? Am I, I don't think I'm exaggerating this. So maybe a little, but then you get done praying to everybody and, and whoever they, okay, at this time we're going to officially dismiss and we're going to close. But there's always like two to eight people that think that's right for everyone else, but not for them. And then they like circle up because they know the best prayers come at the end because you're kind of warming up in the middle. You're kind of just processing through, you know, partway through. But then at the end, like this is when you can really get you dialed in. And there's always a group that keeps coming even when you say to stop coming. And so when it just says Jesus dismissed the crowd, I don't know what that looked like. But eventually Jesus was by himself and he went up to the mountainside. Why? Because he needed to make sure his toolbox was still fully uh, 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 resourced through the discipline of private, private discipline known as prayer. And when the evening came, they were alone, but, but the boat had already gone a considerable distance from the land, being buffeted by the waves because the winds were against it. So at this point, I don't know if the disciples planned on being to the other side or if they were just hanging out there waiting for Jesus or if the storm was to the point where they couldn't keep going. I love it. Uh, for those watching online, we can hear our nav kids, which this is the first week that they're back. And I love the noise. I love the noise. I want to see what they're doing. No, I can't do that. So, so the disciples are just kind of out there and why they're out there, how they're out there. I, for me, for today's conversation, I don't, it doesn't really matter. But during the fourth watch of the night, which let's just say 3 a.m., Jesus, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake again. Why don't you add a whole lot more to this sentence? <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm not sure where Matthew decided to, you know, cut, trim the fat, but he could have added a little bit here. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, which, by the way, I'm sure I'd be right there with them. They're exhausted. They just fed thousands of people. They've now been on a boat trying to either get to the other side or stay upright, making sure the boat is against the waves so they don't get tumbled over. They're probably physically exhausted, mentally exhausted. And if you've ever done a large amount of ministry, you can be spiritually exhausted. And all of a sudden they look up and there's this glowing object hovering, walking, if I was Jesus, I would have done like this figure skating thing, you know, just like really freaked him out. Like, okay, Elsa, good to see you. Like, uh, good. I'm uh, right after I said it, I thought no one's going to get that one. And then Jesus said, take courage. It is I don't be afraid. Hey guy, it's Jesus. You guys know me. I'm on my way out. And all of a sudden, Lord, if it's you tell me to come and walk on the water with you. And obviously, this is the part where we hear all the time that Peter gets out of the boat and everyone in the boat's probably going, Peter, what are you possibly doing? And it's because this part of the story is normally shared separate than the first part of the story. But if you think about it, this is still all one narrative. So Peter is sitting in the boat and says, Jesus, if this is you, call to me. He's like, come on with your bad self. And Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came towards Jesus. And I'd like to point out, he walked on water and came towards Jesus. Five feet, 50 feet. Does it matter? It's more than us. He walked on water. That's what it's saying to us. So the distance to me doesn't matter. Peter got out and walked on something. And I know it says water, but I, here's the thing. I don't know if it was water, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. But all of a sudden, 
When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sing, crying out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught him up and said, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they climbed back in the boat and the wind died down, those who were on the boat worshiped Jesus saying, truly, you are the son of God. Because there was an understanding that occurred. And, and here's what we can say. Peter, why did you doubt? Peter, why did you get out of the boat? And I would say this. The rest of the disciples, why didn't you? Because here's the thing. It wasn't the guys that fed the 15,000. It wasn't the fish that fed the 15,000. It was the word of Jesus that they believed that fed the 15,000. And when Peter said, he's living in this euphoric spiritual moment on this boat, living this amazing, will go down in history story. And Peter sees Jesus and he's walking on water. And G Peter thinks to himself, if you just had me feed 15,000, I wonder if I can walk on water with you because I couldn't do the other thing alone. No way I can do this alone. But if you're doing that and you let me join in, maybe you will let me join into this. And my faith is willing if your word said it about the fish and it produced, there's a chance your word will say it and I can walk. And so when it says, oh, ye of little faith, I know we want to put Jesus in this beautiful, perfect robe because apparently he was glowing like a ghost, looking at Peter going, oh, you of little faith. I think, and this is just me, I think Jesus was going, oh, 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 you had the little faith. Oh, buddy, you did. How many have ever helped their kids ride a bicycle before? How many of your kids have ever learned how to uh, uh, hit a ball, put on roller skates, something like this, and they go for a little bit, then they fall down? You don't look at them and go, oh, you idiot. <laughs> oh, you bad peddler. <laughs> oh, you, what do you have, vertigo? <laughs> I don't know who would make that face, but I just did, and it's forever on camera. Like, like, there's no time. You know what you do? You run behind them. You run behind them. And all of a sudden, you let go a little bit. And they go to turn by themselves, and they fall. And you go, oh, oh, you were so close. Oh, you started pedaling. Just keep pedaling. Hey, hey, just keep pedaling. I know you want to stop pedaling because you think you're going too fast. But pedal a little bit more. And when you pedal a little bit more, you'll find out that the words that you're living on are mine. The kids don't have boldness of themselves. They believe, Daddy. They believe, Mommy, that if you just get on the bike, then if you just pedal, you'll be able to soar in a way you never had before. And when Jesus says, get out of your boat, get into your personal ministry, because you can't do it on your own. But if you believe the word that I'm telling you, the word is this, that you can do everything that you should do and watch everything that I will do. Oh, oh buddy. Oh, buddy, you're so close. Oh, you're so close. And then when it says that all of them said, truly, this is the son of God, personally, this is when the rest of the disciples went, we see it now. It's his word. It's his power. It's what he brings to the table. And what he brings to the table is what everyone else needs to eat of. But he's not setting the table. We are. We set, we set the environment, we set the conversation, we set the place for Jesus to minister. But if we say, I don't know enough about the Bible, so I'm not going to start a nav group. Well, congratulations, no one does. And, and, and I know you're going to say, well, pastor, have you ever been stumped? Well, guess what? I do this for a living, and here's a newsflash for you. I get the same 10 questions. Prove to me there's God. Well, that's real simple. Have you ever said to anyone, prove to me there's Santa? No. You know why? Because everyone knows there's no Santa. By you very asking the question for me to prove that there's a God proves that there's something that you know already exists. Good. Next. Like, I get the same 10 questions all the time. Tonight, you can go home, Google hard questions to answer from the Bible, and you'll stump me. But it's because I've been willing to be in a place to where God had to show up for an answer. When someone calls, just so you know, if you ever call me, 
and you're at the hospital and you just say, I need someone here. I never know what I'm going to be able to do for you. I never know what to say. But somehow every time I show up, every time someone I show up, the family says something like, so glad you're here. This couldn't have been, you don't know what this means. And you know what I just think? It was just a lousy fish. It was just a piece of bread that I had. But somehow it was what they needed at that moment. If you wait to be prepared in life to do anything, you'll do nothing. And when it comes to your personal ministry, it's time for you to do something. And here's what it is today. Get out of the stinking boat. Because if you don't, doesn't it just show you that you don't believe his word? Because Jesus is no longer here to move forward his ministry. He left that up to us. So what does personal ministry look like for you? I would say this, that when you get that unction by the Holy Spirit to say something, to do something, to move with something, you do everything you can do and leave the rest up to God. If you get a phone, and by the way, I'm not making phone calls this week, but when you, when you hear that nav groups are starting back up and you know you have a gift of hospitality, but I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can lead the Bible study. Listen, do what you can do and leave the rest up to God. When it comes to nav kids, well, I don't know if I'm good with children. Oh, hang on a second. You, you, you are. Why? Because you're able to smile and you're able to love on them. If that's all you can do, you do what you can do. Well, at work, we've had people say that they wanted to start a Bible study, but I don't know what Bible study to start. But can you start with gathering people? Do what you can do and just see what else God will do. And so, Lord, today, I just, I just ask for a desire for each one of us to find the place where personal ministry can occur. And if the church, the, the navigation church is a catalyst for that, to help get the ball rolling, to get our feet out of the boat and start stepping, then God, I'm thankful for that first step. But Lord, I pray that it does not, Holy Spirit, hear me here. I pray that it doesn't end with these four walls. Because all of these stories that are captured for us in this holy word happened outside the temple walls. It happened in a group. It happened in a family. It happened at a lake. God, give us understanding today of what personal ministry looks like. If you have your eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you to stay kind of in this moment of prayer with me. If you're here with us today, if you're in our online campus, if you're here today and maybe this story about Jesus is one of the first ones that you ever heard, I want to tell you another time when Jesus reached his hand up and pulled us out of death. And that is when he gave his life on a cross to die for our sins. You may not know it immediately, but I can tell you eternally, he saved you from your sin. And what is sin? Sin is those actions that you do that immediately you feel dark inside. Those actions that you do, you hope no one else knows about. Those actions that you do that keep you up with regret at night. Jesus came to free you from all of those things. And how do we become free from them? We recognize him as our Lord and Savior. You, can, you believe it in your heart and you confess in your mouth. So if you're here today and you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you're part of our online campus and you're ready to say yes to him, I'm just going to ask you to do something very simple with all eyes closed and just me looking around. If you're here today and you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand in the air so that I can see that you've made that decision. And for those, that's for those in our Collinsville campus, for those on our online campus. If that's you today, possibly one of the pastors are putting in the chat right now, that if you said this prayer for the first time, like this button. Maybe a tab has popped up for you to say yes to it. Or if you're on any of our other formats and not with us live, I would ask you this, just send us a message. Let us know that you said this prayer, maybe for the first time, or maybe you've been away from God for a while and you're ready to re-engage and and connect with him for a long time. So I'm just going to ask everyone to say this prayer out loud with me today. Dear Jesus, today is the day that I give my life to you. 
Thank you for having your hand extended even when I didn't know I was drowning. Pull me up today. Become Lord of my life and forgive me of my sins. God, I thank you for every decision that was made, every life that was changed. And from now, from this moment on, God, let us view personal ministry just a little bit different. Holy Spirit, thank you for what you've done here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. For those a part of our online community, thank you for being with us today. I'm just going to stop right here and let Pastor Aaron give you a, quick, a few quick announcements. Thank you once again for joining us right here for Navigation Church Online. We hope you are both strengthened and encouraged by today's message. And if Navigation Church has ever helped you in some special way, we would love to hear about your story. Feel free to share your story by emailing us at mystory at navchurch.org. If you'd want to support Navigation Church today, you can mail your contributions to 1205 Vandalia Street, Collinsville, Illinois, or join the many giving online through the Give tab on our app or website at navchurch.org. You can also visit our website for more information, support, and even prayer. But join us back here next week for Navigation Church Online, and make sure and follow us on Facebook for more community connections throughout the week. But for now, from us to you, Thank you for joining us, and God bless. Hey, thank you for watching this message from Navigation Church. We hope it strengthened and encouraged you today. But let's not stop with the message. I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss out on a single message. I also want to invite you to join us in person or online every Sunday morning at 9.05 or 10.45 at our Collinsville campus or even our online campus at navchurch.org or our Facebook Live by following our Facebook page. And make sure to check out navchurch.org to discover more about Navigation Church and ready for this and even plan your next visit with us. Thank you for watching. I look forward to meeting you soon. God bless.